Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Capitalist Investor. As always, you have me, Diamond Hands D, and Cool Hand Luke. How are we doing, bud? Not too cool. Not too cool. It's kind <laughs> of kind of hot today. I don't know if I'm getting sick. I don't know. Usually you get cold if you get sick. I don't know. I feel like congested. Yeah, got I feel like flashes. burning up or something. I'm, yeah, I'm getting... I'm like going through like... Was it menopause? Is yep. <laughs> yeah. Could be. Could be. All right. Well... Uh, I don't know how to segue out of that one, <laughs> but <laughs> there's no good way to. Uh, yeah, we've so got. We'll uh, just dive right into we've it. Got good old retirement planning today. The planning corner that is usually Tony Zebigala's favorite, Tony mm-hmm. the Tigers, but he's not here. He's on assignment. Um, but we got today target date mutual funds. Yeah, are there so so much fun to talk about target date <laughs> mutual funds? Well, yeah, you know, I feel like um, I feel like it's it's actually a pretty good topic to talk about. Because when I'm talking with people out there, um, you know, obviously my clients don't don't really have them anymore. Um, but as people, you know, come in here initially, it's uh, it's a very easy and um, popular, I, I would say, way to invest, especially inside of people's 401ks. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a really good um, idea to to kind of dive into what the pros and the cons would be uh, of those target date funds because uh, there are there are some of both um, but you know um, let's kind of dive into exactly what they are before we get going so when we say target date funds um, you know it's fidelity has them t row price has them um, you know essentially every um, you know financial place Um, custodian has a target date fund and what exactly it is it'll say you know fidelity and then it'll give a year so 2045 and the idea is it's supposed to be the year um, in which you retire so um, and basically as as you get closer to retirement so as time goes on um, that 2045 fund is going to get a little bit less aggressive over time so um, so basically, if you were in a 2025 fund right now, that would be one of the least aggressive. So the, the, the balance between stocks and bonds would be, um, you know, closer to probably a 60, 40 at that point. Uh, whereas like a 2045, where I, I mentioned earlier, would probably be around, you know, um, probably 75, 30, uh, 70, um, 75, 25, something like that. So, um, so they basically adjust for, um, risk over time. Well, that, and that's what, that's why they're, a lot of people have them Mm -hmm. and why the 401k providers have them is because they're perceived to be kind of the way to invest without being involved. Like if you have a 90, 10 portfolio and be you're aggressive, 90% 90% stocks, 10% bonds when you're 25 years old, and you buy a 2055, 20, 2060 20, mutual fund, like that aggressiveness should come down without you having to do anything, assuming you work the same job for 30, 40 years. Now, right. here's my quick issue is, you know, the 30, 40 year old or 20 year old is not working usually the same job for 30, 40 years anymore like it used to be. So you, there there always has to be kind of the active, more component involved. But like you said, it's good that it's you know helping people get involved, doing, taking on the investments for them, managing the risk for them. But also, you know, the fees in these kind of usually can be pretty high. Like I, I've seen upwards of, you know, uh, whether it's T-Row, whether it's these other companies, usually Vanguard's a little cheaper, but like, you know, sometimes they're upwards of 1% um, yeah. every single year. And you don't really know what you're getting, like, for that 1%. You don't mm-hmm. know what exactly. Usually they're, they're, you know, really they're just investing the S&P 500 and the aggregate bond index. They're not really doing too much more sophisticated right. than that. So you're paying 1% to get the same exposure you would buying the SPY or QQQ ETF um, in the AGG or throw on the bond side. And then you're not getting tax advice. You're not getting retirement advice. So it just, these fees usually can be a little high. You, if you do have these, make sure you just check your expense ratios. Yep. For sure. Because, uh, you said it there. So they're, they're <clears throat> and, and I would say that's probably, uh, what I'm about to say is probably one of the biggest drawbacks to, to these, uh, target date funds. Um, you know, they, they adjust over time. They don't adjust based on what's going on in the market. So you can get, um, you know, timing issues, right? So where, you know, 2045 fund says, you know, beginning of the third quarter, we're going to, you know, get a little bit less aggressive. But, you know, what, what what's actually going on in the market, you might want to get a little bit more aggressive. Um, it, it's going to take that, you know, out of your hands, essentially. So um, 
which is why they typically underperform just regular market indexes is because as they're adjusting that can lead to timing issues because they're the goal isn't to time it right the goal is just to reduce the risk on a schedule well re- reduce the perceived risk exactly. so he, here I, I don't want to go too far deep into this this is a retirement you know planning corner but this always goes listen every conference i go to every dinner i go to around this industry everyone's like all you got to do is invest in the stock market over time in 40 years you'll eight percent compounded every year and you'll retire with a couple million dollars like that's what every person says because they're using history as a gauge for the future. So history says, if you look to history, that you know stocks will outperform, bonds and stocks will do really well, small cap stocks always win in the end because you know, America's always growing. Um, so that risk adjusted like is using history, 90%, 10, 80%, 20, depending on how old you are. That's all using history. I think this world and environment we're heading into, you can't always use history as a gauge for the future when it comes to risk when it comes to the management of your portfolio. So that's my only issue sometimes is, you know, I, when everything works for everybody, things tend to not to work anymore. Right. And it seems like the whole philosophy of, all oh, you got to do is save into a 401k for 40 years and pump money away and invest it in the S&P 500. That's all you need to do to become wealthy. I, everyone seems to be doing it now because it's kind of built that way. The structure's built. I don't know if that's the way anymore necessarily. Oh, <laughs> just throwing a big curveball in at the end, huh? Yeah. I like it. So expand on that a little bit. I, I just think that, you know, you have to be more conscious of where you're placing your money. Yep. Like you have to be, look, look, 401ks are built for the tax, you know, getting tax deductions. Like you, it is in the in, in industry, taxes are the number one hindrance to wealth. So yeah, you need to save money into your 401k, but also understanding that, you know, when the markets rallied, you know, so much off the bottom and bonds uh, have, we're paying 5%, um, that bond portion of your portfolio, like when rates come down, actually do pretty well. So I'm not saying you have to always try to time things perfectly, yep. but like even if you're younger right now, I know this sounds crazy, but I think like the bond portion of a portfolio could be a great hedge if to actually make money on a portfolio on that side of things. So like the 90-10 aggressive portfolio, like you know taking risk into account, maybe makes sense to be like 60-40. Like the 60-40, you might be back right. is what I'm saying for even mm-hmm. a younger person. Yep, absolutely. That's an excellent point Um, because we saw that right in in 2022 with, um, you know, I think the aggregate bond market in 2022 was down probably. um, It was 20%. Yeah. It was down just as much as stocks. Mm -hmm. So whatever goes down quick can come up quick. Whatever goes up quick can come down quick. So yields going up quick can come down very quickly. Mm -hmm. All it takes is one thing to break. Yep, for sure. So I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I'm just saying from a risk standpoint, I don't know. I start, you know, bonds might be a little more attractive uh, from even a, an investing accumulation standpoint. Yep, for sure. So, <clears throat> so yeah, keep in mind, you know, you're you're not necessarily uh, usually a four hundred one k is a you know savings vehicle, a tax deduction vehicle, like Luke just mentioned. Um, you're usually not trying to you know kind of time the market and things like that. It's it's meant for a long term savings. However, you know, what Luke just said is, is super important. You just don't want to put it on autopilot. And, and just to clarify, I'm not usually referencing when I talked about that whole spiel. I'm not referencing the 60-year-old, mm-hmm. the pre-retiree, the retiree that still has their money in a 401k. I'm talking about someone in there that's 25, that's 30 years old, that wants to plan it for the next 30 or 40 years. Mm-hmm. I just don't know if we're going to see the past 30, 40 years, even with the boom and bust cycles, 08, 09, tech crash. I don't know if you're going to see as much recovery so quickly yeah. like you did in 08. I know 2000s were the kind of the lost decade, 2000 to 2010. Um But it just feels like a lot of this was pulled forward. That's all. I'm just saying, if you're young. All right.